right, so we're going to continue uh, our morning about data dignity. And for the next speaker, I'm really honored to introduce you to Sean, um, I'm going to say your name right, Moss Pultz, Sean, Sean, uh, who is the CEO of Bitmark, uh, a startup establishing property rights uh, for digital assets. And Sean is going to talk about uh, how property rights can help uh, with data dignity. And um, Bitmark and um, has a goal of uh, really establishing property rights for any type of digital data, uh, from music rights to healthcare uh, and real estate or artists, uh, also royalties. Um, so the goal is, yeah, I'll let Sean um, take over and uh, give him a great round of applause. Great. Okay. Um, hope this is okay. The microphone's good. Yes? Great. I feel more natural holding something than having it to my head. Sorry. Um, this is Bitmark. Uh, we make a universal system for digital property rights. Now first, um, a bit about myself. So uh, I've been in Asia. I moved to Asia 15 years ago. Um, I'm a software person, uh, programming since a little kid, and I wanted to learn hardware. And so I made um, an open source mobile phone. This was sort of the precursor to Android before iPhone. And um, really great project. The last time I was in Berlin, was we had a team that was working on a Linux kernel here for this phone. And so my latest startup, hopefully my last startup, is Bitmark. And we're making um, a property system uh, for digital property. So we have investors um, in the east uh, from China, also from the west, from the US. OK. Um, three things today. So first, the data crisis. I'll give you my take on this. Second is I'll explain what we're trying to do to help. And then finally, i um, super excited to share a new project that we've been uh, kind of secretly developing and we're ready to announce, ready to talk about. So the data crisis, we're gonna look back and we're gonna think of the data crisis like the great financial crisis, perhaps even bigger. And it's pretty singular. I think people don't realize how bad it is and how, how much this singular company has destroyed the values of what people for decades were trying to build. And so it started with a deal in exchange for being able to share photos of our of our loved ones, our friends. We let them sell us uh, really kind of simple things, socks, didn't really matter. And over time, the people selling us things, they got smart, or you could say more nefarious, and they realized they could sell us all sorts of things. Not just socks, but they could sell us candidates, and they could sell us ideologies. And as I watch this, as I go around the world talking about the need for digital property rights, what I've realized is that when you're constantly sold something all day long in everything you do, eventually your free will starts getting eroded. You no longer have consent, you're bombarded. And I think if you look at social media and you see what's going on, there's a form of a psychosis that's happening. So Bitmark, our mission is to fix and restore the trust in the internet that Facebook has destroyed. To be able to solve a problem, you really have to understand it. And this is, I think, the easiest way to understand Facebook is they've created a man in the middle attack on the web. Like a data sucking vampire, every communication that you have is being intercepted all of the information, all of the data they can, repackaged, rebundled, sold to the highest bidder in a perpetual auction. And so you are not talking direct to people. You are not connecting with friends. There's always a man in the middle. And for me personally, when I realized that, it's very disturbing. So I grew up with the internet. 
I put myself through college by building websites. And so the values of the internet and of the web specifically were things that I feel were worth defending. And so the, the initial origin story of the web was this personal information system. And it was supposed to be a tool for two people to the whole planet to be able to use, to come together to solve uh, if you're a physicist, you would say you could solve these ecological issues. But it was really to solve societal level problems. And I didn't actually know this until around four or five months ago, but when I was more singular focused on Facebook, I went back and tried to read more about the origins of the web. And I found this paper written in 1996, almost like a post-mortem or a retrospective. And the conclusion of it was that the web, like the internet, was designed to be end-to-end. -end. And this, this idea of end-to-end -end is, is so important. Uh, the internet was built on TCP, this protocol that would route packets of data such that if something happened in the middle, if a router went down, if a country went down, it wouldn't matter. You, it would still deliver that packet. It would still deliver that information. And even as early as 1996, Berners-Lee feared that governments and, and others, when he said others, he was really referring to corporations, would mess with the, the, the end-to-endness, if you will, of the web. And so he said specifically, there was a call to action in the conclusion, that if the law of the land didn't respect this, then the engineers would have to go back and figure out how to engineer more protocols that could be end-to-end. -end. And there was two that he mentioned. First was information ownership, and the second was payments. Um, everybody here, I'm sure, knows Bitcoin. And I got obsessed with Bitcoin around 2012, and the idea of somebody being able to make a money just blew my mind. Money was like the weather. It's there, you can't change it. it. It is what it is. And so for the longest time, I thought of programmable money as being this super interesting thing, and I did not connect money to protocols that could make the internet and the web stronger in such a direct way. And so now I think of uh, Bitcoin as the first end-to-end -end payment protocol. I started Bitmark in 2014. When I first used Bitcoin, of course I dismissed it, but then when I went back and used it more and really actually dug into what was going on there, I was like totally convinced that there will be digital money in the future. And so, being the son of a lawyer, um, if you're gonna have money, you need property. These two go together. They're like kind of two sides of the same coin. Extremely different in how they behave, but money and property, um, peanut butter and jelly, whatever the analogy you want, but these go together. And so I wanted to work on digital property. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how that would behave, but I felt that if we're gonna have money in this internet, then we would need property. Now. The way I would explain it now is we're building an end-to-end -end protocol for the ownership of information. It's a property system, and what we're doing is issuing something known as a property title, like a bundle of rights, and we allow people to experiment with different bundles. So let me go into this a bit. And when I realized that, okay, there would be this need for digital property, the question is, okay, well, where do you start? And so I looked at like 15 different verticals to try to find good use cases that would show the need for digital property. And um, as luck would have it, in my backyard is the Spotify of Asia, the largest music streaming service. And so KKBox, uh, their um, chairman was explaining to me that there's this problem in the music industry that comes about from decades of um, intermediaries that obfuscate the ownership information of songs. And so 
um, for an artist to get paid when they stream their music, uh, it might take, uh, in the East, it's six to eight months. In the West, I've been told it's longer than a year sometimes. And so we worked with them to put the rights, fractionalize the rights of the song, and have artists be able to receive their royalty check, not in you know, a half a year, but a few times a month. And um, that was really sort of eye-opening for me to see how you could bring multiple parties together and to use sort of this, this, this independent neutral ledger to allow people to trust each other again. And about that time, a few years, um, few years ago, uh, we were approached um, for health. And so I want to speak a little bit about what we've done in health. Um, this is really for the past two years where Bitmark has spent most of our time, most of our energy. And um, the, the previous dean of the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley, uh, in a conversation with him, what I learned was that the public health researchers, uh, they're craving data. They are, are, are starved, I should say, for data. And what they really want is to be able to source data from a much more diverse group of people. Um, public health is usually white men. Women are completely excluded almost. And so what we did was to set up um, a few studies, one for diabetes, one for women's health, and to crowdsource data from individuals. So individuals would donate data and the researchers would then use this data um, in their studies to uh, come up with better, um, better outcomes, more inclusive studies. And while we were doing this, um, it was quite eye-opening to me at least um, about diabetes and how big of a problem with this was and how globally it's a huge problem and how in Asia it's an absolute crisis. And so we partnered with uh, the largest um, diabetes monitoring platform. They make software people run on their phones and it helps you to uh, monitor diabetes. You have to be just very vigilant with this. And speaking with the different um, stakeholders, the insurance companies, the doctors, the, of course, software platform companies. Um, everybody believes that if they had access to the data, you could get better outcomes. And so what we did was to come up with a software stack, if you will, that would allow the pooling of the rights to use the data. So individuals that were using the software, this mobile app, to monitor their diabetes could choose, if they wanted to, to opt in and contribute their data um, into a trust-like structure and get paid. And so we partnered with uh, one of the largest private banks over there. I would love to pay in Bitcoin. Nobody wanted Bitcoin. Um, and uh, to pay them in the local currency um, in exchange for being able to use their data. Um, but the data would never leave the trust. So the computations, sorry, 10 minutes, cool. The computations would be run directly on that data. And, um, and this, um, this is actually one of the larger, so, so this launched in uh, July, the first sort of smaller prototype of it. We built another system that fixed a few of the privacy problems of the first one, just to make sure we could really keep that data safe. Um, and I think this is gonna be one of the largest uh, diabetes studies um, period. Uh, the, the, the scale of this is still extremely discouraging. We're doing a similar thing um, with Pfizer, but this is about how could you have many studies and many people and match both ways to preserve the privacy, both ways. And this was the focus of Bitmark for uh, the better part of the past two years. And then starting in, in July, I don't know, how many of you have seen this, this film? Okay, I wish more people would see this film. Um, it's an amazing film. My friends kept telling me, hey, you should go see this film. And I'm like, no, 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 like I know the story. It wasn't a hack. That's Facebook's API. That's the way it was made. That, that was the point. And when I, finally did watch the film, I was like, shame on me. Like, they were able to phrase this as, look, the hack was on society. Your data was used to hack society. And I told my wife, I, I, was, I was out of the country, I said, hey, can you watch this? And she started watching it, and she meshes me. She's like, I can't even breathe. 
And so I deleted my Facebook account in 2009, and I told my wife to do the same thing, and she did. But then now we have a son, and he's in first grade, and all of the, the, the courses, all of the um, curriculum, the homework assignments are in Facebook groups. And so my wife doesn't know this, but I know she has a Facebook account that she keeps pri private from, from me to be able to keep up with our son. And when I went back home, I walked in the door, and she said to me, what did you think? And I'm like, what do you mean what I think? And she's like, what do you think of the movie? And I said, it's scary. And she said to me, what are you doing about it? I was like, what do you mean what am I doing about it? She's like, well, if Bitmark is about digital property rights, why aren't you working on something here? And it's like something only you know the, the, the wife or your husband or whoever can tell you, just like a hit to the face, like I was jarred. And um, I thought about this for a while. What could we do? What should we do? And what I realized is that the model we're trying to set up with help, this extremely sensitive data, to allow people to share this data together but not get stripped of their privacy, this is how people should be using all of these networks. And so um, I'm super excited to share this. These are um, uh, screenshots. We're launching this app next month. And what we did was to automate the process. Now, it's not super automated, but it's definitely a lot better than what Facebook gives you now. <coughs> to get your information archive from Facebook. And then from this archive, we show you how you use Facebook and how Facebook uses you. And so we've been looking at this data, at this information archive, and generating all sorts of really interesting insights. Um, what ads you are matched against, your facial recognition data. Um, all of this stuff is in there, but it's not really easy to surface. They just give you this zip file, this dump. And so we've put this into what I think is going to be a really great tool for people to understand their data. Now, our vision of this is, of course, to go back and fix these problems with the internet, the information ownership piece. And data itself really was not understood, I don't think, the way it is now, um, when Berners-Lee was even writing that retrospective in 96. And so each individual person, when you get your Facebook data, we give you your own, essentially a VM, your own personal data store. Now these data stores, you can run computations on them. And this is the data trust architecture that we developed for the diabetes data trust. So each person has these. Now on top of this, we've developed a framework that allows people to connect in groups. And the group itself, you can define the rights and the privileges, almost like a charter, if you will, of the group. And this defines how data is stored. And you have a community data store now. And on top of this community data store, we, our partners, um, hopefully more people in this room, we can get together and we can provide services to people that can unlock even more value of their data. So the, the vision of Bitmark, the point why we're here is that we truly believe data is the next major asset class. And that the framework of property rights, this, this legal construct of property rights, legal economic construct of property rights, came first from land, and then it was extended for knowledge, patents, trademarks, copyrights. And now we're in this information revolution, and we badly need a better framework of property rights. And this is the problem that we're trying to solve. How do you allow for radical experimentation of different property right regimes and to do it at a cost structure that the whole world can use. So it can be extremely inclusive. It's not China has theirs and US has theirs. How do we build one capable of scaling to the entire world? So that's um, my talk. Uh, um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today.
Thank you, Sean. Yeah. I think you'll get some questions during the panel, but yeah. we, I know we have to put furniture up here. Um, does anybody have questions? Hi, uh, I have two quick questions. Have you heard about this concept called subject access request? It's more UK law. And the second thing is, have you heard about HAT, H-A-T? They actually have exactly what you described. And they use subject access request to get the data from Facebook and offer the same thing, if you haven't already heard of them. Um, I'm not familiar with them. Um, They've already got like an infrastructure in place and uh, it might be worth having a conversation. Yeah, I'd love to, I, I, would, I would love to be connected with them. Any other question? Let me just make one more comment. So um, I think we need the, um, the engineers, the technical people to really work on getting this data out and into a format that's structured because the tech companies are gonna work as hard as they can to just give you these dumps of this data that's useless. And so the more we can partner, the more we can kind of combine forces on, on getting this data and putting it into a format that's useful for regular people, the better. Yeah. Hi, Sean. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the... Me? Uh, yes. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Voice sounded familiar. But. It's all right. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the medical data yeah. experiment, and I think it's quite delicate the way, the way you put it. But I might have misunderstood the, the, the model behind it. Mm. But the usual thing that people say about um, monetizing data is that you... Uh, Basically, people that are more fragile and more uh, with less um, income, um, they would mo be more likely to sell data. So I was thinking, what, how does it work when you use this data for health experiments and whether you, uh, in this particular way, you might have um, biased results. For instance, in diabetes, poor people might have more yeah. health diseases and therefore fuel a whole thing of biased experiments. Um, in other words, how do you reconcile this fact that more poorer people are more prone to sell data and therefore yeah, the totally. as experiment? Um, so of course I believe in sort of the, um, the ideas of decentralization, um, but I feel that there's certain types of data that, um, that the way it's used, um, the repercussions if it's used wrongly are just too high. Um, you can't have it a free for all. And so um, what we've done is to take um, um, the idea of a trust structure and to combine people like Pfizer and Berkeley. So like if you could say sort of um, the dark side, the light side, you know, Darth Vader, the Jedi's, um, put them together and to create a system that they can both use and they could both be okay with. And so um, the, I can go into this a bit more in my panel, but um, uh, we actually had to pass Berkeley's uh, um, they have an institutional review board that looks at the data privacy, data security. We had to do all of that before they would even consider working with us, let alone running something. And so that's, that's um, our approach, is to put people on the governance side that understand how this could be misused um, and to get the technology aligned with that, not the other way around. Um, here's one. Yes. So. Gold. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, that was very nice. Um, on the first slide, on one of the first slides, you mentioned your investors. One of your investors is Alibaba, yeah. if I recall this correctly, and we talked about Facebook. Um, so just to be honest, like Alibaba also has like a very vibrant data exploitation business yeah. <laughs> going on. So um, do you find this problematic to have them as investors, and how do you handle the stakeholder relationship where, or maybe even feed ideology back to the company? Yeah, I mean, um, the world is messy, right? And I can tell you, I, I don't talk about this, but my pitch to them, the way that I got them to invest is to say, look, um, you guys have more data than anybody in the world. I, I truly believe that. I mean, Alibaba is like Facebook and Google and eBay, whatever, combined, and Amazon. I mean, they're huge, they're crazy. And um, so, I told them that the rights to the data that's in the cloud is gonna be increasingly important, right? And, um, and that they should invest in us because we will be able to um, develop infrastructure that will allow for different ways of using this data, different types of rights, different types of, um, 
control, right? And um, so I'm trying my best to, to put a mixture of people, both as investors and the projects where you do bring the Pfizer's in with the UC Berkeley's. Because I think the world, when, when you do something in reality, it's always messy, it's always nuanced. So I've tried from all levels, from the investors to the projects, to the people on our team, to keep this diversity, to keep both, you know, both the East and the West, both the, what some people would consider you know, the devil and God, like put them both there, right? Because I think that tension is what's important to getting this right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're gonna stop the question, but please uh, find Sean afterwards and uh, continue the discussion. I'm gonna be around all day, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.